Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Today, I'm going to speak on the subject Kingdom of Servant Kings. This is from our series on Kingdom. Kingdom of Servant Kings. Write that down in your notes. And we are going to continue. If you were not a part of our series the past three weeks, you got to get those tapes. But this morning, we're going to pick up in this segment. I want the young people to listen very carefully this morning. I want to speak specifically, especially to our young people, those who are uh, from about 10 years old and up. If you are here, if you're not in uh, a, a stages this morning, uh, I think stages is not going on this morning, is that right? Yeah. I really want the young people to catch this message today because if the, if the youth of our nations catch this, this revelation, we will have a completely different generation. This subject, the kingdom of servant kings, is a paradox because the entire kingdom of God is a kingdom not of servants and subjects but a kingdom of kings the problem with this paradox is that this is the only kingdom where the king is the servant and this is why when Jesus talks about the two kingdoms he said the kingdom of this world is a is completely contrary or opposite to the kingdom of God because in the kingdom of the world the kings are served by the people but in the kingdom of God the people are served by the king and therefore it is an upside down kingdom that is why the gospel that we preach is very different from the world of fallen man I want to make some comments about the gospel First of all, the gospel of the kingdom is the good news about a kingdom. That may sound monotonous, it may sound as if it is simple, but it's not. The word gospel means good news. And the message that we're supposed to be preaching as a church worldwide is supposed to be this message the gospel of the kingdom the word gospel means what good news so you can literally transliterate that and it says you should preach the good news of the kingdom so our gospel is the good news about a kingdom therefore our message our good news is not about Calvary Our good news is not about even the resurrection. These are important aspects of the work of redemption, but these are not the good news. The good news is about a kingdom. Secondly, the gospel of the kingdom is the only true gospel. Jesus told the disciples when he sent them out two by two, to specifically preach the kingdom of heaven has come. The only true gospel is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Now, why am I saying this? There are a lot of things being preached by the church. Some of the things that are being preached by the church are good things. Let me give you the devil's most successful strategy. Write it down. It is called Satan's most successful strategy. And it's this. Preoccupation with good things. Satan's most successful strategy is not to get you to do something bad. Satan's most successful strategy is to get you to do something good that is not right. 
people who are morally upright, who have a desire to do good, want to do good, good people like you and the millions watching this program and sitting in their homes and their hotel rooms and wherever you are, the good people who, who don't want to break the law of society, good people. Satan loves good people because he knows he can't get you to rob a bank or to commit murder. He knows he can't get you to steal or, or to, to bear false witness openly. He knows he can't get you to, to maybe get involved in, in antisocial behavior like maybe gangs. Or He knows good people like you will not get involved in drug trafficking and, and, and pornography. He knows, but, but his real big strategy with you is just to get you to do good things. Let me tell you what, it takes time to do good things and it takes energy to do the good things and that's all he wants from you, your time and your energy. If you did an excellent job on a good thing that was not the right thing, you did the wrong thing. So Satan's strategy against the church that Jesus founded 2,000 years ago was not to get them to do a bad thing but to focus on getting them to do a good thing so he slightly changed their message you know <laughs> if you got a communication from somebody and it was slightly changed, you didn't get the right communication, did you? Well, that's what Satan has done to the church. Satan has slightly changed the message, and, you know, Satan doesn't want you to, to preach anything bad. But he had us preaching some good things, like Calvary, like the blood, like the resurrection, like healing, like the baptism in the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the average religious Christian person knows very little about the gospel. They know a lot about the work of Jesus, the redemptive work that he performed, they know some of the miracles he did, we preach these things. As a matter of fact, the gospel has become the work that Jesus did, not the reason why he did it. I have heard preachers uh, in many big forums challenge me when I make statements like this. Here's a statement. Jesus never preached. You must be born again. He never preached that. And yet, when I say that, the average well-conditioned Christian believer who have been well effectively brainwashed by the devil react to that negatively. Some even quote scripture. I remember in the fine state of Virginia, Beach, Virginia, I was in a room with some very intellectual people. Some of them you may know. Very well-known Christian leaders from America. And I was on a panel. And they were discussing all kinds of wonderful things about the Bible. And they got on to talk about the gospel. And I was quiet because I was afraid to disrupt their theological gymnastics. <laughs> and they noticed I was quiet and they said, what is your opinion? And my answer was, I have no opinion. But my government says that the gospel is not you must be born again. And the room was quiet. I said, Jesus never preached born again. Matter of fact, he only mentioned born again once in the entire four Gospels. 
once. I said, we preach it all the time, but he never preached it. Secondly, he never made that statement publicly to the multitudes. He never told the multitudes you must be born again. He never did. Now, I don't care what you say about that. that try it. It's not in the Bible. He only mentioned born again once, and he only mentioned it to an old man in the night about 3 o'clock in the morning who woke him up. One of the pastors, big bishop he was, he grunted for a few minutes, held his hand up, and said, I beg to disagree with you. And he gave me his dignified language. He said, you know, uh, we got to be careful what we say uh, because we could confuse many of the young believers. I was thinking, they are already confused. He said, didn't Paul say, I preach Christ and him crucified? And you say that Calvary is not the gospel. Didn't Paul say that he preached Christ and him crucified? He said, what do you say to this? And I was silent for a moment because I wanted to remember his question. And I said to him and to the illustrious cadre of intellectuals, uh, sirs, if you may allow me, please, let's stay with the Bible. First of all, Jesus is more important than Paul. Can we start there, sir? And the issue here is not Paul, it's Jesus, the founder of the church. And Jesus did not preach born again as the gospel message. I said, secondly, if you will turn with me, and I had everyone to read the Bible. Because you know, in the midst of those kinds of environments, you got to stay with the word. So you can protect yourself. So I turned to the book of Acts. And if you can turn there with me, we come back to Matthew in a minute. I said, turn to the last chapter of the book of Acts, which we will refer to a little later in this segment. The last chapter of Acts is Acts 28. Paul preached a very clear message. Now, whenever you quote scripture, friends, listen to me, young people, you never quote verses separate from the context. What's the context? Context is what? Pretext, post-text, and text in a text. In other words, you don't isolate verses. When Paul said, I preach Christ and am crucified, he was not talking about the gospel. He was defending an argument against pharisaical theologians who were claiming that a man can be saved by works. And Paul says, no, we are saved by the work that Jesus did on the cross. We preach that, he says. But that was not referring to the gospel he preached. He was defending a theological point. So don't take it out of context. Let's read what Paul preached. Now Paul, let's get a context here. I want the young people to remember this, the context. Acts chapter 28, Paul is under arrest in this chapter. Got it? He's under arrest. Paul cannot leave the town. He's under house arrest by the Roman Empire. This is when Paul had finished his trial in Rome. Paul was preaching uh, to King Agrippa. And he went to Rome to defend himself because he was a Roman citizen. And Paul was, was seen as a, a risk to the Roman Empire because Paul was influencing too many people. Matter of fact, many of the people in Caesar's castle became believers because of Paul's ability to intellectually explain the kingdom. So Agrippa, the king, and 
the house of Caesar were concerned about Paul and they said look we can't really put him to death because he ain't done nothing really against the empire but we can't let him go free because he's going to keep preaching this, 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 this kingdom and this way of this thing Jesus and he's going to mess up our entire empire so what we'll do is we'll put him under house arrest so they arrested Paul now house arrest is they do it still today house arrest means uh, what's the word they use for that when when you come out of jail but you can't go nowhere what they call that probation it's another word they use parole that's it house arrest is like parole okay so Paul was on parole Paul couldn't travel he couldn't go out of the city he couldn't leave town and he had guards watching him but he could live in the house you know he could go you know work and everything but he couldn't go so so he was on parole everybody clear now Paul is an old man now and Paul is about to you know wrap it up and this was the time this is you know God is good Paul had his rent paid food paid for clothing paid for by the government ain't God good and guess what Paul is doing during this time writing what is he writing Corinthians Galatians Ephesians Philippians Timothy Titus he's writing all these books you have now these were his letters he was writing them all expense paid in a hotel provided by the government man give God a hand that's deep man God's good eh God said Paul you worked hard you traveled hard you went all over Asia Minor up and down preaching the gospel I mean all over Europe man you work well Paul you started churches you ordained ministers you trained young pastors Paul you did a good job I know you're tired and the last thing I told you to do is to preach to the king and you did that so tell you what let's take a vacation so Paul had a prepaid vacation financed by the government of Rome in a house paid for by the Roman Empire food provided by them clothing laundry by them God set him up and all God says now I'll tell you what to do write for them folks in the 21st century will you do that so Paul began to write and that's where Paul wrote most of the letters we have today Philippians and Timothy and Titus Philemon and Thessalonica all those letters were written during that time and Paul was being pampered he was called a house arrest prisoner ain't God good now it's during that time Paul is writing his final notes to the churches so what you're about to read is actually Paul writing from the house the book of Acts ends with Paul in this place now if you look at chapter 28 if you got a topical Bible somebody got a topical Bible the topical Bible see mine right there it says what Paul preaches at Rome under God everybody get that anyone got that in the Bible yeah okay hold your hand you got it in the Bible see okay see your Bible is on target right good that's a good Bible Paul is Paul is what? Preaching at Rome under God. That means he's under parole. He's under the government's uh, watchful eye. He can't travel. So we read the chapter, Paul is under house arrest. Now, the last three verses in this chapter is important. Because you are reading the words of a man who is on death row. His words. Verse 28. Therefore... I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Now, right to the end, what is Paul staying focused on? His assignment, eh? Right, right to the end. I mean, here's a guy who's a Jew. He was called to minister to the Gentiles. And right to the end, he's still saying, look, man, this thing that I've been preaching is for the Gentiles. I'm staying with my vision, I'm staying with my purpose, staying with my assignment, I'm not going to waver. I don't care how old I get, I'm going to keep preaching the same thing to the same people I'm supposed to preach to. Let me tell you friends, this is an important lesson to learn, okay? If you were called to be a part of this ministry, and you were born to be a part of this vision, and to go in the future with this vision, you might as well get used to me preaching the same thing. Amen. Now, if you get tired of what I'm preaching, then that means you're supposed to be here. If you need a thrill, need a little spill, go somewhere else. We're going to preach what? We're going to preach leadership development. And I, when I grow 97, walking with my little cane, I can say be preaching 97, leadership. Why? That's my call. Am I clear? Okay, so let's get, get used to that. Now, we can preach it all through the Bible in many different thousand ways, but it can be the same thing. Paul stay with his message. He says, I am sent to the Gentiles. Sent to the Gentiles. Look at the next verse, verse 29. 
verse 31 rather for two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and that word rented is referring to the house that was rented for by the government they paid for Paul's house he stayed in this rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Why? He couldn't go out. Paul is under arrest. So everyone, so now, the, you know, the Roman government is under God's control, you know. They, they can't, you know, they got to set this up. So everybody's going to see Paul. All the pastors from all over the place come to Rome to visit Brother Paul. Those who he Paul ordained probably came, you know, joining to see him. You know, our apostle, we got to go see the guy who started the ministry. Everybody came to see Paul. Even some of those who wanted to know more about the gospel came to see Paul. Some of his protégés like Timothy and Titus, young fellas, let's go visit Papa Paul. So everybody went to see Paul. Maybe uh, Silas and, and you have guys like Barnabas, let's go see Brother Paul. Paul's in Rome. Now remember, <laughs> uh, the disciples, Peter, James and John, those guys are not in Rome. They are far south in Palestine. They are in Jerusalem. That's far away from Rome. So they have to travel to visit Brother Paul. Paul is way up in Italy. They are down there in the Mediterranean Sea by Jerusalem. That's where the church started. And so they're far away. They go to visit Paul. Everyone goes to see Paul. Even some of the pagans who were convicted, they got to go ask Paul about, you know, getting born again and how do you receive the kingdom. And they come to see Paul. All the folks come to see Paul. Let's see what Paul preaches. Read. Your own Bible. Read it, please boldly and without hindrance he Paul preached what what did he preach I'm reading the Bible boldly he Paul preached the kingdom of God now we got a problem here it says and he taught about what the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now, this is a very important statement because it shows you Paul's priorities. Let me just stress something for you theologians, you deep people who are watching this program. You can, let me talk to you theologues. You theologians should know better. Every letter, everybody say letter. letter. Say it again. Letter. The books that we call New Testament epistles are exactly that. They are epistles. What's an epistle? It's a letter. It's not intended to be a theological discourse. It's not to be a presentation of Paul's gospel. The letters that we call books were actually written to address problems that were in churches. These were not to declare what Paul preached. Matter of fact, some of these letters were even by Paul himself said to be his opinion of certain things. Am I right? I mean, you had smart people in this church. Now, you all read the Bible a lot. Sometimes Paul would say, look, uh, this is not from the Lord, this is just my opinion about something. In other words, these were letters. Paul was having problems being sent to him. In some of the churches, they were having problems with authority, or problems with morality, or problems with money, or problems with abuse. And Paul would then write these letters back and say, let me correct these problems. So Paul is not presenting what he preaches, he's dealing with issues. Are you with me? But here we see in a place in the Bible, declaring what Paul preached what did Paul preach Paul preached the kingdom of God and then he what taught about the Lord Jesus Christ now let me tell you this thing changed my life years ago that's why I'm a different kind of preacher we reverse that what's the reverse we preach Jesus Christ first no, we didn't reverse it. We don't say nothing else about the kingdom. <laughs> when you turn the red, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, Brother Jose. See, see, we don't understand it, man. Okay. 
Guess what, guess what we are? We are a family. Am I right? We have one father, the Lord. We got a big brother, Jesus. We all got the same spirit. We are in a family. So, so there's a difference between hi, family business and outside business. I'm trying to change your mentality here. There are some things that we only talk about in the family. Anybody got a family? I mean, you got your own family, right? When you, there's some things you don't let your neighbors know about. When you're doing your little arguments in the house, you, you don't announce it to the neighbors. There's some issues that are just what? Family business. Now, a lot of things in this book are family business, and then a few things are for the public. For example, Jesus <laughs> never told the public about Calvary. Why? That's family business. Show me in the Bible where Jesus ever stood up in the multitude anywhere. Come on, find in your Bible. I dare you. Come on, theologians. Argue with me. Find in the Bible where Jesus stood up in the public and says, I'm going to be crucified. And they will rip me. And they will kill me. And I will go to hell and rise again. No, the Bible says he took his disciples aside. Every case. And he began to tell them about his death. It was a private family issue. But whenever he went out to the public, he would say, the kingdom of God is like a man who goes into a field. The kingdom of God is like a woman who lost a coin. The kingdom of God is like a man who was planting seeds. He preached them to the kingdom, to the public. But in private, he would say, Oh, I groan in my spirit because I'm going to die soon. I want you all to stay with me. Please don't leave me. Don't abandon me. Be, it's private business. And he would say, to him, he, said, he said, I'm going to do this for the ransom of all them folks out there. But that ain't their business. Their business is to know about the kingdom. Yes. Here we find Paul's priority. Paul preached the kingdom of God, and then he did what? Then he taught about the Lord Jesus. Write the word preach down, and write the word teach down. Two different words. To preach means to declare. To preach means to declare. To teach means to instruct or train. In other words... <laughs> You don't start teaching until the person believes. That's right. Teaching is not for the world. It's for the believer who has already been taken from the world. That's why Jesus never preached to the multitude. I mean, teach the multitudes. He didn't teach them. He taught his disciples, but he preached to the multitudes. He declared the kingdom of God. But then he would sit his disciples down. He said, look, uh, the keys to that place is really given to you. I've given you the keys of this place. i telling them about it, but I'm giving you the keys of it. Not to it, but of it. Very important difference. So, do you know why the people on your job really ain't Christians right now? Because you are preaching to them Jesus Christ. Well, it's tough to teach this. I feel like a man in the desert by myself. See, that's not what you're supposed to preach. You preach the kingdom of God to the folks on the job. Tell them that you can get your citizenship back. There is a kingdom that belonged to you before you was even born. You were born to be a part of a government rulership that have dominion of the earth. Your condition is not supposed to control you. You're supposed to control them. Your circumstances are supposed to run your life. You're supposed to run your circumstances. You're supposed to be dominating your finances and your emotions and your problems. You're supposed to be on top of this thing. Folks want to hear that. People ain't worrying about no blood or no cross. They worrying about how they're gonna make it through the day. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. Amen. 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 And that's why this is the devil did a good job, man. He got us preaching the means and not the end. 
He did a good job. You know, that's why, listen carefully, that is why most Christians, and I'm glad I'm not one of them anymore, but that is why most Christians keep backsliding. That's why we, we get bored with this stuff. Because we really didn't come to a kingdom, we came to a man. Hello? And there's only so much you can do about a man. You tell him you love him 500 times, afterwards you get tired of that. You sing a couple of songs to him for a couple of years, and then you say, now is this all to this? I got to go pay my bills, take care of my children, I got to make, make ends meet. You know, I, I appreciate this man, Jesus, but listen, I, I got to know how to live this thing. What, what's this about? Right. Let me ask you a question. Listen carefully. It's a very important question. <laughs> When you change citizenship, if you did, or if you plan to, what, uh, 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 who do you pledge your allegiance to? The president and the prime minister of that country, or to the constitution? Now, that's a good question. <laughs> if you decide to become a Bahamian citizen, you don't pledge your allegiance to Hubert Ingram. Thank God. <laughs> Keep the TV on, Brother Ingram. Why? Because Ingram could change. When you become a U.S. citizen, you don't pledge your allegiance to, to President Bush. You, you, you don't join a man. <laughs> you join what? A kingdom. A country, a constitution with laws and promises and commitments. And you have your part to play in keeping the law, and then the government of that constitution have their part to play in protecting your rights and giving you the services that the government promised. Well, that's exactly what it is for the kingdom of God. Listen, listen to me carefully. Listen, see, I'm trying to get you young people, don't be stupid like us. It took me years to get this straight. Jesus never said, I am the kingdom. Oh dear. He said, I am the door. Now listen to me. What is a door? The door is not the building. It's going to be a good series. Listen, you ain't coming to, listen, suppose you spend all your life coming here, worshiping the door. Never come inside. This is a beautiful door, lovely door. I love you, door. Beautiful door, glorified door, sanctified door. Will you please come inside? <laughs> a door is what? A gateway to another dimension. Come on, you all understand this thing. <laughs> Jesus said, I am what? The way. <laughs> I'm not the, the destination. What have we done to him? You, like Paul, were seeking for a life, not a person. Now, Jesus said, I am the gate of the sheep. Pen. I'm the pen. I'm the gate of the sheep pen. When you come to me, I am the one who gets you into this thing. So Nicodemus, whew, he's an important guy. Nicodemus came to Jesus at 2 o'clock in the morning and he said, Good master, I know you are a man sent from God. John chapter 3. He says, And I believe that you are sent from God. His question, How do I enter this kingdom? Jesus never said, you found me, buddy. It ends, buck stops here. Just stay in this house, worship me, kiss my foot. Tell me how nice I am for the rest of your life. That's called religion. He said, no. He said, Nicodemus, except a man be born again of the spirit, he cannot what? Enter. This is something that you enter into, man. The kingdom of heaven. So, 
Paul did something important here. Paul preached the kingdom and he what? Taught about Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 This takes the pressure off you, you know. Because you don't want to be talking about blood in the boardroom. You don't want to be talking about blood on the school ground. You don't want to be talking about blood and nails and, and the spear in his side. Because that's not what you're supposed to be talking about. You got to talk about how to solve people's problems. That's good news. Say, hey, you know, this thing you're going through, yeah, man. There's a higher level of living you can live that can whip this thing. There's a higher attitude you could have. There's a higher vision you could have for your life that can overcome these problems. And man, this thing is for you free. And the person would say, well, how do I get there? Then you tell them about born again. The good news is not Jesus. Is that tough for you, for you to hear? The good news is the kingdom. He said it himself. Matter of fact, <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. Tell them, but I can tell you a million scriptures. I don't know what to do, Lord. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Am I right? Yeah. Say that with me. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Say it again. Jesus preached. He did not preach himself. <laughs> this is tough on religious people. He preached. What the gospel of, and then he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached on. He didn't say preach me. He said preach this gospel of the kingdom. What is gospel? The good news is the kingdom, not Jesus. Let me ask you a question. And this is the vision God gave me about this thing years ago. All right. If you sell shoes, you have a shoe store, and you sell good shoes, I'm talking about, you know, snake leather and calf leather, I mean, goods, whatever, you know. You got these expensive shoes, right? And you want people to come and take advantage of your merchandise. So what do you do? You go on television, radio, and you're going to do what? Advertise. Advertising is what? Preaching. So you're going to preach your product. That's what advertising is. So you go on radio and television and you start, now what's your goal? You want them to come into your store to buy your stuff. Is that the goal? Yes. That's, what, that's the goal, right? So here you are now, you're on television and you go, I want to welcome you to Shoe City. It's a fantastic door we have. The door is made of brass and glass with gold-plated nuts and bolts. The hinges never make noise. It's a powerful door. The door is beautiful. Fantastic door. Awesome door. Wonderful. Magnificent door. The door of our store is wonderful. It's the most beautiful door you've ever seen. Beautiful door. We even sing about it. Beautiful at thou door. I mean, beautiful door. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Will they come to your store? They don't even know what you selling. That's exactly what the church has been doing with God's mandate. Jesus loves you. That's not the good news. I know it sounds good. <laughs> Jesus said this, boy, my, a thousand scriptures going through my heart right now. I mean, oh, this bursting in me. Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 20, 25, a verse we read, we're going to read it again. Then the king will say, this is uh, verse 34. 
Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance. What is the inheritance? It's not Jesus. <laughs> take your inheritance. What's inheritance? The kingdom that was prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's in your Bible. He says the inheritance is not me. Okay, let's be honest now. If your, <laughs> if your daddy left you $10 million in the bank, and I am the executor of the estate. In other words, your father left me as the trustee, because you're too young to get it. And he says, when he comes of age, make sure he gets it. Everybody say, executor. I'm going to bless you now. Therefore, I am what? I am the mediator between you and the million dollars, $10 million. I'm the mediator. Everybody say, mediator. There's one mediator between God and the kingdom that was yours from the beginning. Now, when you come of age, that means you get born again. <laughs> you come to me. You ain't come to look at me, look at my clothes, worship me, kiss me. What you come to me for? You come to me because I am the key <laughs> to your kingdom. <laughs> Jesus, look at Jesus said, look, he says the king will say, who's the king? Jesus. The king will say to who? To you. What? He said, the king will say, come. Don't come to him. Come and what? Inherit. What? Not the king. Come and inherit the stuff that was always yours. In other words, I'm just the way for you to get it back. That's it. Praise his holy name forevermore. I died on the cross, shed my blood, went to hell, and I got some keys for you, buddy. Came back from the dead, and now I come to tell you, you can get your stuff back. Yeah. Praise his name, somebody. That's why Christianity is such a boring religion. Because we are stuck with the door. Every Sunday we're talking about the door, the door, the door. We want the shoes. We want to walk in the real thing, man. We want, to, we want to live out our inheritance. We want to cash the money. I mean, if you come to me, Brother Neely, you know, and, and you, you, you qualify for the money, and for 20 years I keep telling you the money is good, good, you know. The money nice. <laughs> You know, I appreciate, you should have seen the money I saw, buddy. Wow. There's a lot of money back there. I know it's yours, but boy, it's beautiful money. You like my suit? <laughs> Check my face. Look at my fingernails, man. Check me out. Worship me, boy. Describe me. For 20 years, you're talking about me. And you ain't never get the money. He said, this is about what? Your inheritance. I believe that before we die, God's going to have a generation who finally get the message right. I believe that with all my heart. I can be part of that generation. I don't care how long it takes. We're going to work with this until this thing kicks in. Jesus was not going to a kingdom. He was living in a kingdom right then. Man, my heart's in this thing, man. He stood before Pilate. He said, Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, but it is here now. I live in it. I live in under different laws, Pilate. Now. You all don't understand what they're talking about. When you go to work tomorrow, you have kingdoms. They have their laws. You got your own. So when they say it can't happen, you kick into the other government. The government says all things are possible. <laughs> You understand me? But that got to become a reality, not a religion. Amen. So when the bill come, the water bill come, light bill come, look at that. You say, now under this kingdom, I broke. 
but I better switch over here to this kingdom. My God shall supply. I don't pay my tithes. I don't give my offerings. Man, another kingdom kicks in. Man, y'all talk to me, man. This thing is real. But you see, we still religious. So we get nervous when the rent payment get close. And one thing with the kingdom of God, it doesn't operate on doubt. So if you doubt the rent payment coming, the rent payment don't come. You block it by your lack of faith. You now some of you work for government. And uh, you know, in many cases, the government doesn't give you your money. They send it to the bank, don't they? Direct to the bank, they pay into the bank. So how come you go to the bank Every time you get paid, without even doubting whether the money there. You just go there and tell the people, I want to write this check. I mean, somehow you just believe that big machine they call government sending my money. I don't know how they're doing it, but my money there. Well, the same way God is telling you that his kingdom is making deposits. Yeah. You got to think this way. Christ said to the disciples, what are you worrying about? They say because based on our government that we were born into, we ain't got no food to feed these people. Christ said, that's your problem. You ain't thinking two kingdoms. You know what he did? He looked at 5,000 people. And Jesus was in a different world. You, know, you couldn't live with Jesus. He'd blow you. He'd confuse you. He looks at 5,000 people and the men standing right next to him these are businessmen. They could count. 5,000, three rolls, two fish. No. So they, in their head, they done what? Calculated based on their kingdom. Yes. 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 Jesus looks at 5,000 and go, I got more than enough. I got 12 baskets left over. Come on, y'all talk to me. And he, so, now watch him. Now he's going to talk out of his kingdom. And it's going to ricochet in this. He said, feed them. He never said, go find food. He said, feed them. As far as he's concerned, plenty of food around here. Feed 5,000 people. In his kingdom, there was no lack. The government had deposited enough bread and fish on the account. See, there's stuff already deposited on your account, but you ain't drawing on it because you ain't living in that kingdom. You as a Christian. Christians don't live in kingdom, they survive. That's why life is so tough, my beloved, because we ain't, we ain't shift kingdoms yet. This kingdom, it's the last point there, and I even need to have a message yet, Lord, time gone. This kingdom is what? It's not what? Heaven. Write that down. The kingdom is not heaven. See, we got this thing about, well, when we all, what you mean when we all? You in it now? This thing is now. Christ said, the kingdom of God is with you. That's when he had it. He said, but it shall be in you. And then when he was raised from the dead, he breathed him. He said, he said, receive the Holy Ghost. He says, now you have the kingdom. You ain't going to the kingdom. You don't talk to me, man. So, okay, some of you think you can't be in a kingdom and be in a different country. Well, what do you think you are when you go to other people's country? Come on, talk to me. When I go to America, I am still a Bahamian. Surely you got it. <laughs> so Christ says, I am in your country, but not of your country. And I under the laws of your country, because I got a higher law. This is my country. So if you don't treat me right, I kick in. That's what you become a part of. Some of you in here today, you don't have a personal relationship with God. And I don't blame you. Because you know, the church confused you so much. You ain't sure what you're supposed to join. He said, well, if I get saved, it means I join this church. Or I join this religious group. Or I join this denomination. Or I join this demonation. 
you know, he said, what, what do I do? See, and people are confused. Some folks been to the altar a thousand times trying to find the kingdom. Christ told the Pharisees, he says, he says, you know what your problem is? You lock the kingdom up from these people and won't even go in yourself. That's religious people, man. And then he says, you put burdens on the people they can't bear. You know, do this and do that and do this and do that. Man, let the people have fun, man. Let them come into the kingdom and enjoy their inheritance. If you don't know him today, then you ain't in the kingdom. But please, don't throw him away because of your religious experience. I am here to tell you that Jesus is the door. He's the way. He's the truth that tells the reality of the kingdom. He is the life that gives you energy and gives you entrance into the kingdom of God. That's what he does. He died so he can wash you clean from your sin, so he can take you into your inheritance. Not for you to become a religious person, but to become a citizen of a kingdom. Man, that's what he died for. If you understand anything I said today, I want you to lift your hands and just thank God for a little bit of revelation. Go ahead, just worship him for a second. Just thank him. I hope I've explained a little bit. Oh my Lord, we got a lot of Sundays to go, but this is going to get better. Go ahead and confess. Confess your citizenship this morning. Come on, ask God to change your thinking, all right? Tell him I want to become a, a conscious citizen. Not just a paper citizen, a conscious citizen of your kingdom, Lord. I want to embrace your laws and your promises and all the commandments you gave me to keep. I want to embrace all the benefits. I want a health benefit. I want educational benefit. I want the anointing benefit. I want the social benefit. I want every benefit that the kingdom has for me, Lord. I want everything. Go ahead, just tell him, thanks for it. Everything, he says, your king already knows what you have need of. Go ahead and thank him for your deposit on your account. For everything you need for the rest of your life. Go ahead and thank him that everything you need is already on deposit. Thank him right now. Thank him right now. That's kingdom thinking. Everything I need is already provided. Hallelujah. Everything I need is already provided. Praise God. Everything I need is provided. Thank you, Lord. Oh, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And everything you need will be provided. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.